Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Redford, and this is the follow up coming up on tonight's show. What can we expect from the economy in the new year from interest rates to inflation to the impact of world events, not to mention it's a presidential election year, which can also impact the economy in different ways. Two local economic experts are with us tonight live to give us their insight and what it may mean for your pocketbook. But first, we would like to hear from you to help drive the conversation here on the follow-up. You can do that via social media on Facebook. You can dial into our follow-up hotline to voice your opinion or suggest future show topics. You can email us and you can comment on YouTube as well. If you'd like to watch any of our past shows this season, just log on to deltapublicmedia.org. In studio with us tonight, two guests. We have Chris Douglas, uh, economics professor at the University of Michigan Flint. He's a regular here on the follow-up, so glad to see you again, Chris. Always great to be here. And a newcomer to the follow-up, uh, Zachary Cole, assistant professor of economics at Saginaw Valley State University. You guys are going to make a, a good team, so nice to have you here. Oh, it's nice to be here, Mike. Let's jump right in and, and talk about, I guess, monetary policy for the new year. A lot of people are trying to figure out what the Federal Reserve is going to do with interest rates after a series of sort of increases of the last year, year and a half. Most believe at some point, maybe closer to maybe March or April, they might start doing some some cutting. Uh, they did originally, of course, to ease inflation. That seemed to work. So, Chris, I'll start with you. Do you have any idea, any look in your crystal <laughs> ball what they're going to do? So the best you could do is look at what the market expects the Federal Reserve to do, and the market's priced in at least a few Federal Reserve rate cuts over 2024. So the market's thinking that inflation is slowly coming back down to the Federal Reserve's 2% target, which means the Federal Reserve shoots for inflation running at 2%, prices on average rising by 2% year to year. Inflation right now is about 3.5%. So the market's saying if inflation glides back down to 2%, that will give the Federal Reserve some breathing room to do maybe two or three, maybe slightly more interest rates cuts to give the consumer perhaps some breathing rooms in terms of the high rates they're paying on mortgages and car loans and things like that. Yeah. What about your crystal ball, Zachary? Yeah, I think the Fed yeah. is also echo uh, echoing that sentiment as well. Uh, they're going out and saying that we have achieved a soft landing. There's no need to keep increasing interest rates any further. That inflation's coming down. The economy is looking relatively strong. So I think in the future we could see, yeah, those interest rates start to decrease and go back to a level that we're more comfortable with. So, so define the soft landing. I kind of told you before the show that's not a term I was as familiar with and, and, and why you do. History tells us that the U.S. managed only one so-called soft landing in about 60 years. So define sort of soft landing, and, and what can we read into that if it's been 60 years since we've sort of had this soft landing? Yeah, I mean, it's very tough to do. So yeah. essentially, we are trying to fight inflation without causing a recession to occur. So whenever you play around with one fundamental aspect of the economy, like interest rates, and you start to increase them to decrease inflation, the risk is, well, that's also going to cause a lot of investment to go away, a lot of people to stop buying houses, and consumption to go down. So naturally, a recession seems very likely. The soft landing is, let's decrease inflation without causing that drop in recession, uh, that drop in GDP to cause a recession. And it seems like we have achieved a soft landing, which is a monumental achievement. So what are your thoughts on sort of whether or not we'll actually hit the recession. Some have said it sort of feels like it because the economy has been just at this sluggish pace uh, and that maybe the recession isn't out of the woods yet. Yeah, that's always the risk because recessions are very sudden, very hard to predict. You can go back to December 2007. Job creation was fairly robust, um, 106,000 or so new jobs created that month, which was pretty good for an economy that was largely at full employment. And then all of a sudden, January 2008, uh, everything just totally falls apart for the next two years. So just because things are good right now doesn't mean things will be good moving forward. These recessions happen without much warning. And I think that's what people are kind of worried about because if you go back like the last really 20, 25 years, starting at the new millennium, 2001, We've had three recessions, two at the time were the worst recession since the Great Depression, COVID, and then the Great Recession. So people's memories are pretty good to go back 20 years. They're just kind of like, well, when's the next shoe going to drop? We've had a lot of recessions, not a lot of economic booms going the other way. It kind of feels like we're due for something bad to happen. But there's no guarantee 
there's going to be a recession, which I think people's memories, coupled with the fact that interest rates are up, traditionally that has caused the recession. If you want to think about the opposite of, of a soft landing, go back to 1981 and, and 1982 when the Federal Reserve last bought inflation under Paul Volcker. That was a very, very hard landing. You have a recession where you have 10% unemployment nationwide, 17% unemployment in Michigan. So there's always that worry in people's mind that, well, given what's happened in the past, are we kind of due in 2024? Maybe we escaped into 2023. Does that just mean that it got put into 2024? You know, my students use that same phrase, uh, the shoe is going to drop. And mm -hmm. I think that is like a pretty good indicator for how people feel about recessions and how they feel about the economy at large. And sometimes that's enough to cause a recession. If I think that we're gonna have some economic hardships in the future, I might start saving more now. And if everyone's doing that all at once, it slides GDP back and we get a recession. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting how, how motion can play a role in this, right? I think before the show we were talking about, maybe your students said, uh, well, we talked about consumer sentiment. Would they feel one way or another do if, if, the, if the Fed goes ahead and decreases the rate a, a point or two or whatever you call the basis point, uh, that might go, okay, this is good, or what do you call it, the economic vibe? Yeah. I, I, think, there's, I, think, I think a lot of people are just ready, ready for, for the rates to drop just a little bit. Uh, maybe that, that convinces them to go out and buy a house. Yeah, yeah that could be part of it. Um, I think another part of it is, is that people are, I think a lot of people are waiting for prices to get back to where they were before the pandemic. You know, we had the better part of 25 years with very low inflation before COVID and, they did, and then the inflation that set in. So people are, are like, well, how could you say that inflation is slowing down? My grocery bill is still going up. Well, inflation slowing down doesn't mean prices are falling. Inflation slowing down just means prices are still rising, just not as rapidly as before. So your grocery bill is still going up, just not as fast as what it was in, say, 2021. So that's not very comforting to people to say, well, look at the bright side. Prices aren't rising as fast as they were. People kind of want things to go back to where they were in 2019 and 2020 before the pandemic set in, and that's just not going to happen. Inflation is just a tax. So when prices rise, your purchasing power, your wage doesn't go as far as before, your life savings don't, doesn't go as far as before. And then when inflation slows down, you never get that purchasing power back. That's just a tax that is gone forever. And I think that is one reason why people's vibes aren't very good. They feel burned by the loss of purchasing power they suffered under the pandemic. And it's tough to know that that's just never coming back. Yeah, and those of us that are um, uh, much older, I recall buying a house, you know, 25, 30 years ago when the interest rates were 12, 13%. And so, gosh, when it went down to three, three and a half, how many years ago, wow. And now it's up to six, maybe below seven. I'm still saying that's not too bad, but those that maybe not as old <laughs> as I am, it looks outrageous that it's six and a half, right? Sure, so. yeah. It's just kind of funny. And home prices haven't come back down. They shot way up during COVID. Right. With the Federal Reserve cut rates to zero during COVID, that pushed the 30-year fixed mortgage rate down to about 3%. That's a great time to buy a house, which lots of people did, especially the people who were cooped up in a small apartment in a major city due to the shutdown. So the demand for housing surged during, during the pandemic, shot housing prices way up. Well, when mortgage rates started rising, housing prices haven't come back down yet. They're still at the pandemic high. So people who are in the market to buy a house are facing both a record high price on average, plus high interest rates, which just really blows up the monthly payment people would have to pay now if they buy a house compared to if they bought like in 2021. Sure. You know, overall 2023 was pretty good compared to what we had economically. Uh, inflation uh, waned just a little bit, but in December it did took a little blip up. The question becomes, is, is that just a one-time sort of thing that happened at the end of the year or, could that be a trend? I guess we'll have to wait until the end of January. Any thoughts on what happened in December? Yeah, hopefully it's not a trend. Right. Uh, it might just be a hiccup. Uh, right. It could have been caused by many things, seasonal fluctuations and spending habits. Um, all of that could have factored into it. I don't think it's going to be a long-term trend. We're not going to go back up to 5%, 7% because we're in a way different zone than we were back then. Sure. You're dealing with supply chain problems, problems caused by uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine. Yeah, and we're seeing, you know, globally, things aren't exactly great right now, but nowhere close to as bad as they were, right. you know, uh, post 2020. Yeah, you brought up the global, and I guess I'll go into that. Uh, the uh, impact of global events, uh, whether that's 
the continued sort of sluggish economy in a lot of Europe. Plus, we have uh, the conflict in Israel. We have the conflict on Ukraine. So when that call comes into play, uh, how do you think that's – how is it impacting us now? And, and if that continues, what does that do to us here, here at home? So it hasn't impacted us yet. So when Russia first invaded Ukraine, the price of oil shot up to over $100 a barrel. I think it was Memorial Day 2022. Price of gas was over $5 a gallon. So that was a real risk factor for the economy because traditionally when there's an increase of in the price of crude oil, that results in a recession. We had the oil shock in 73 to 75. There's an oil shock in 1980, oil shock in 2001. People kind of forget about that the price of oil doubled between 2000 2001 oil shock in 1990, the recession that cost the first President Bush his re-election. So that's a real worrisome sign that the price of oil shot up in 2022, given the history, but no recession followed. So oil is down a little bit right now. Gasoline is hovering right around $3 per gallon, nowhere near $5 per gallon. There's a worry with Israel-Gaza that the shipping lanes um, over that part of the world were being disrupted by Yemen, which is forcing shipping companies to move away from the Suez Canal, shipping around the uh, Cape Horn in Africa. That could be a problem in terms of disrupting global supply chains, but that seems to have backed off. So the worry about these global events is that it could cause a massive disruption in the production of a key resource like oil or disrupt global supply chains, which could cause a recession. Fortunately, that hasn't happened yet, but there's always that concern in terms of what's going to come next. Yeah. I'm optimistic. I think the, the White House has expressed um, concern. They don't want to be drawn into a larger, mm -hmm. uh, larger uh, regional war that will cause that to happen, that will cause oil prices to go up even further. So mm -hmm. again, optimistic, but it is definitely um, something that could spiral into a little more economic chaos for us at home. Yeah, and along that note, it is a presidential election year. Uh, who knows what's going to happen and with former President Trump. He, uh, he resoundingly won the Iowa caucus this week, last night. Uh, remains to be seen if he's going to be the candidate. But clearly he has said if he is uh, elected again here, uh, he's going to start drilling. He's going to push um, combustion engines again, right? Um, and I know uh, the Biden administration continues to push the, you know, the, the Green New Deal, the you know, the green package and uh, to kind of get us weaned off of all of this oil. So any thoughts on how that's going to play out? Yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big believer that the free market can kind of regulate itself. So whenever you get government intervention, either putting subsidies into certain areas, um, that perverts the free market a little bit. So putting a lot of money into oil might be good in the short term, but if that's an industry that's not sustainable in the long term, which there's a lot of indications that we're moving away from that towards more nuclear power or more renewable energy sources, um, then we're betting on the wrong horse. Um, so not necessarily that you know we should be putting a lot of money into the green resources either, as we don't know if we can be competitive in that field yet. Right. But yeah, it's whenever you get these government interventions, it can cause more problems than it helps, actually. Right, right. And if, if it, we do hit right on the Green New Deal, that, that's a growth area for us, right, in the industry in America? Is that a growth industry for us? Could be, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say it's an industry that is growing, whether or not it is what we would call an infant industry, one that is able to grow and then compete on the world stage, that is remains to be seen. There's a lot of good work coming out of China and Germany in green technology and in some areas we just haven't caught up with them yet. Right. So another area I want to hit, Congress is again at odds over the uh, debate about raising the debt ceiling. Uh, now at what, 34 trillion? Is that what it's at? And it continues to grow. Um, they are threatening again of a partial government shutdown. Seems like this is the kind of thing every three months. Um, no matter what administration's in place politically, right? They continue, they talk about uh, not raising it, but then they do. Uh, some of us are saying, okay, I'm just cynical. Why does it matter to me? They're gonna raise it and they're gonna move on. But at some point, uh, the national debt's gonna be called in, right? We gotta make a payment on that. 
Well, you would think that all debt would have to be repaid eventually. I guess the key word is eventually. Is that in 100 years or in 10 years? Well, we hope it's in 100 years because we have no ability to repay it in 10 years. But the reason why we keep having these debt ceiling crises is because every year, Congress and the President tack on an extra $1.5 trillion or so to the national debt. So no matter how much they raise the debt ceiling by, two months down the road, given the amount of debt being added to the national debt with the budget deficits being run, they're going to be bumping right up against it again and have the exact same fight. And there's absolutely no evidence that the debt ceiling does anything to keep the national debt down. All it does is introduce a bunch of uncertainty into the economy. You know, if you're a traveler, every two months you face the uncertainty of is there going to be a government shutdown or the air traffic controller is going to show up or the TSA agent is going to show up. Because the way it works is if you work for, say, the TSA, you don't get paid when the government shut down. You get paid your back wages when the government reopens. Well, the labor market's pretty robust right now. A lot of those workers will just go find a new job. And you find yourself waiting three hours in line at the TSA. You know, there's a lot of things the government does you know, day to day that we just kind of take for granted besides you know, air travel. If you want to go to a national park this summer, there's a government shutdown. Those are closed. So all it does, these perennial uh, every two months or so debt ceiling fights, all it does is inconvenience the American taxpayer for absolutely no benefit. Sure. Yeah. I am not for the debt ceiling in general. It uh, tends to be very archaic. It's kind of like if you were to buy a bunch of things with your credit card. The debt ceiling would be when you're ready to pay back that money at the end of the month, you have the money to pay it back, but you need to then give it to the credit card company. The debt ceiling would be like the barrier stopping you from doing so. Right. It doesn't make sense. We've already spent the money. We just want to pay it back sure. at that point. Budgeting, I think that is something that we need to look at, especially our debt is about as high as GDP currently. And after a big expansion like we've just had, now's the time to start pulling everything back a little bit cut some of the fat, uh, some of the government spending we need to trim down, maybe increase some taxes on some level, some form, just to make the economy just cool off and reduce that debt a little bit. Because um, not all debt is bad. Debt can is expected for an advanced economy, a rich economy like ours. And that's for the two. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, the debt ceiling made sense back a long time ago when the federal government would only borrow for big infrastructure projects because if you're doing responsible budgeting, you use taxes to pay for the day-to-day -day routine expenditures. And then if you have like a big infrastructure project, like a new airport or like a massive new interstate you have to build, well, you don't want to raise taxes all in one swoop to pay for that. That'd be a massive tax burden. You want to borrow to spread the tax burden over a larger period of time. So the debt ceiling was put in place to kind of limit how much you could really borrow for a particular infrastructure project, which might make sense so the project doesn't go totally over budget. But here we are in the era of irresponsible budgeting where the government's borrowing very heavily to just finance its day-to-day -day activities, and the debt ceiling makes absolutely no sense in this era. It just gives, like we're talking about, the market and taxpayers uncertainty every two months of whether or not the government's going to be shut down. So it's interesting. W w what's going to change? What, what's it going to take? I is, is China going to have to call on our debt? I mean, wh what's going to kind of change the system, wake us up to say, hey, this, we can't do this anymore? Yeah, the Chinese don't own a ton of debt. They own some, but most of our debt's held by pension funds and banks. So yeah, I don't know what the answer is in terms of w what wakes the system up to the fact that the debt's unsustainable. You hope it's not a financial crisis. Because the hard way you get w woken up is the Treasury Department goes to borrow, and they figure out that no one's willing to lend them money anymore because they're, un they're not confident that, tr that the government can pay back what it's borrowed. That's happened to other countries around the world. It's caused a massive financial crisis. It's never happened to us. It's an open question whether it could happen to us. But the longer we go on tacking on one, two trillion dollars every single year, when the economy is very healthy, we had a good year in 2023, so be adding $1.5 trillion of debt when the economy is healthy is just massively irresponsible. So the longer that goes on, the more likely a harsh wake-up call, be wake call becomes. The best thing to happen would be for both parties to get together, do some sort of like bipartisan budget agreement that says, well, we're going to shoot for over the next 10 to 20 years, it's just how long I think it would take, to balance the budget through things like cutting spending, modest tax increases, but you can't balance the budget without tackling entitlements. That's where the real money is. And no one party is willing to do that because right. they'll just be really nailed by the other party in the next election. So give the level of division, the, la the lack of trust in this economy, 
it, it's just hard to imagine there being some sort of grand bargain to get the fiscal house in order, which I think is a big risk factor moving forward. Yeah, the constituents, it's all about gridlock. We, we, they never can seem to agree on anything. And uh, I think because of that sort of political uncertainty in an election year, what an impact one way or another can it affect our economy going into this year? Yeah, it could be a bad thing. The economy doesn't like uncertainty. Right. Um, I think that uh, if we continue going further with a very charged up political sphere, it's not going to work out regardless of who ends up winning the presidential election, what really happens with the House and the Senate. Um, and I can say that I've seen very negative uh, economic proposals um, from Trump's camp currently. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trump uh, is floating like a 10% tariff across the board, which would be relatively bad uh, for the U.S. economy and the global economy as well. But yeah, I think there needs to be less intense battling and more coming together and trying tackling problems. Yeah, and then of course the pre former President Trump today, after he won in Iowa, talked about the first thing he was going to do was just go back and reduce taxes again. He, he's touting the fact that he had the biggest tax cut in American history when he was in office, which I guess you had to do some fact checking on that, but uh, yeah, clearly there's going to be some wholesale shifting and changes if he, if he gets back in, right? Yeah. yeah, I would say this is not the time for a tax cut when everything's doing well. Yeah. It's uh, stepping on the gas when you're already going 90 down the highway. Right. So back to the Federal Reserve a little bit. Um, from a political standpoint, they're supposed to be nonpartisan, not supposed to be politicized. Uh, and so uh, part of whatever they do, they've got to be a little bit cautious, right? They can go and maybe cut back the interest rates a little bit in the spring and in the summer, but if they start cutting, the closer it gets to the election, that'll see as nonpartisan. I think you guys were saying before, they're not supposed, not only not supposed to do that, but they're bound by law not to do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the Fed does have a lot of um, talented economists, a lot of people who would not uh, hopefully not try to impact the election negatively. In fact, that's the whole point of the Fed, that they are a third party um, economic uh, health monitor and fixer. They are supposed to be insulated from economic pressure so that they can focus on long term economic health. Right. So if something like that did happen, I think a lot of things would have to go wrong in the Fed first. So you guys are both professors. Chris, you're at the University of Michigan Flint. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Zachary, you're at SVSU. So talk to me about uh, what your students are talking about. Uh, are they into it? Do they understand what's happening in the economy? I, I'd love to hear their opinion and how you guys kind of talk to your students about that. Yeah, they love talking about yeah. economics. It's an exciting time to be studying the economy. It's scary. We're all terrified, I think. And my students like show that anxiety every day. They're talking about the other shoe dropping. They, they can intellectually say that the economy is doing well and wages are going up, but they still feel bad. And I think it's re really representative of America. Like even if we're told the economy is doing well, we still feel like it's uncertain and we're on shaky grounds. Yeah, I think uh, students kind of mirror the general public, um, like Zach was saying that. Sure, they can recognize the unemployment rate is 3.7%, but something just kind of feels off. You know, the vibes of the economy just don't feel right. I think a lot of it's we're in, unpre we're in uncharted territory. We've never had a pandemic where a good chunk of the economy was mandated shut down by the federal government. We've never seen this kind of money dumped into the economy like we saw during COVID, where upwards of $5 trillion was dumped into the economy through the three rounds of COVID stimulus. Adjusted for inflation, that's more than what the federal government spent fighting World War II, which is just amazing to think about. So we don't know what the long-term repercussions of something like that is. Coupled with the fact that we never got back to normal after COVID, we kind of hoped when we were going to have the, you know, the quote unquote two weeks to stop the spread. You know, by May of 2020, things will be back to normal. We have May, the summer, into 2021, things aren't back to normal. And then things start to heat up on the geopolitical front with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was a total disaster, a couple of the Russia-Ukrainian war, a couple of the war in Israel. You know, people are just kind of wondering, like, are things ever going to get back to normal? Because we are pushing four years from the first government shutdown, May of, or March of 2020. If things can't be normal 
four years later, will things ever become back to normal? And what's normal even going to look like? So I think it's just this uncharted territory, coupled with the fact that uh, something just kind of you know, feels off yeah. that's got people on edge. Plus, we're going to have a contested election in November. Best case scenario is, given a 50-50 split in the nation, someone wins narrowly, it's not contested, and we have the peaceful transfer of power. But it just seems like the closer the elections get, one side refuses to accept the, result, the results of the election. If things get out of control, we don't have a clear winner like it, right. the year 2000. That just throws a whole lot of uncertainty into right. the mix. So back to your students again, is that generation <coughs> afraid of debt? Do they understand debt? And, and I bring that up because uh, here in the last week, they talked about uh, the amount of credit card debt is just, just through the roof, more than it's ever been before. So. Just wondering if that's a discussion you, you have with the, some of the young people in your classrooms. They are more concerned about their student debt yeah, currently. Sure, and that's legitimate, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say overall debt levels, they're not horribly concerned that there's more pressing things on their mind. Climate change, anxiety tends to be pretty prevalent, along with a lot of political anxiety, and social media right. has really thrown these kids for a loop. We can now scream louder than we ever can without ever you know, using our voices. Right. Each year in about 15 seconds as you look to 2024, what, what's, your, what's your message to take away to the viewers, I guess? Cautiously optimistic given 2023, but always a little bit concerned about can the, next, the other shoe really drop? Okay, Zachary? Yeah, cautiously optimistic is a good way of putting it. Right. Uh, I would say that everything's looking good right now, wages are increasing, and let's hope that trend continues. Yeah, well, Zachary Cole from SVSU, an assistant professor of economics. Glad to have you on, a first timer. Hope it worked out for you. Yeah, it was great. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. Chris, uh, Always been great out a few be times here. for the U of M Flint, representing well. <laughs> Guys made a good team. Thanks a lot. We'll have you back on again. Thank you. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to join us again next Tuesday night for the follow up, right here at 8 o'clock. A statewide group commissioned by the governor has released its findings on how to reverse the state's declining population. So, what have they come up with? That's next week, right here on The Follow-Up. In the meantime, hit me up on social media or dial into our follow-up hotline. We'd really like to hear from you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great night. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And make sure to click that bell icon to stay notified when we upload new content. Videos like this are only possible because of viewers like you. To help support this channel, click on the link in the description below. We'll see you next time.